Good morning and welcome <laughs> to this last day of 2023. And what a fitting way to end the year to come together and worship the Lord together. What a wonderful way to do that. And, uh, you know, we often, at this time of the year, we reflect on the year of the past and the year coming to come. And I think that's a good thing. Um, today has a, just kind of a, a little interesting thing. Today has a special date that will never again be in our lifetimes. And I wonder if you know what that is. Does anyone know? Tom knows. Um, today is the 12th month, the 31st day of 2023, 1231 of, two, of 23. That's 123123. One, three. Just a little interesting fact of the date today. It's so good to be here, and I welcome you again in the name of Jesus, in his wonderful name. And, uh, you know, I, I've been reflecting this week on life. I had a birthday earlier this week, and, you know, years add up. And uh, I've been reflecting on that. And I, I think as we grow older, <laughs> we begin to understand maybe to a greater degree of where Solomon came to and why he wrote Ecclesiastes. And you look at the efforts of your life, maybe in a physical way, and we accomplish things in life. We build houses, we have families, we build businesses, different things that we do. And I know that as I grow older, I look at this and I, I on a, simply on a human level, there's a, there, you come to a point and you say, well, what's the point? I'm going to die. What's the point? I'm going to leave this place. And all the efforts, all the human efforts and physical things, what's the point? And, I, and, I, and I, I'm just saying that I'm, I, I, you begin to see more where, where Solomon was at. He did all these great things. He built palaces. He tried all the different things. And in the end, he said, what is really the meaning of life? It's to fear God and keep His commandments. It's to love. It's to love Him. And for that love that God has towards us to be reflected back to Him and then to the people around us. And if you take God out of the equation, what's the point of living? But with God in the equation, there's a tremendous point. He made us for a purpose. He has a plan for you and I. A plan in this life and a plan for a future and for eternity. And so we as Christians have a tremendous reason to be full of joy, to be full of gladness and purpose because God has made us and put us here for a reason. Every, everyone, every person. As I reflected this morning, I, I read in Psalm 90 how brief that our life is. It's really very short, and it speaks of how short it is. And then it comes down to verse 12, and it says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us, and I think this is a good time at the end of the year. I'm not much for New Year's resolutions necessarily, but I think it's always a good time to reflect. What is the path of our life? What's our purpose? Where are we headed? And to reevaluate and to see where have our feet been walking? And to reevaluate. It's always good to do that. The other thing that I appreciate with the ways of God is He's made things that they always they have a so in, in this life they have a beginning and they have an end. We have seasons. We have spring, we have summer, fall, and winter. Life springs forth in the spring. The summer it grows, in the fall we harvest, and then it all dies in the winter, and it looks like it's over. And then in the spring it springs up again, 
and it grows. And so God has made seasons in our life, and he gives us days that have a beginning and days that have an end. We rise in the morning, we go to bed at night, and then he says, and, our, and, and God's mercies are new every morning. Every morning. It never runs out, it never gets all. And we can go forward always into a new day with a fresh perspective if we apply ourselves to the provisions of God with his love, his mercy, and his grace, and his kindness, and his forgiveness. And so I look at a year. It comes to a close, and then it begins. I had good things this year. I had some things that I didn't appreciate. But I look forward to this coming year because I know that God is in control and that even if I mess up, I can run to him and say, Father, I'm sorry, please forgive me and I can rely on the blood of Jesus. And I know further that this life comes to an end, but then I know that there's a, new, a beginning that is without end, and that's our future. So I'm glad that things have ends and beginnings in this life and that there's a future coming. Would you stand with me? I'd like to uh, have prayer. Let's pray. Father, we bless you this morning. We bless you for your provisions. You are a provider. That's part of your name or is your name. You're the provider. You provide, and as a father, I believe that's your heart and that you love to provide for your children. You don't do it grudgingly, but you love to provide for your children. And you've provided so well for us. You've provided for us in the, in the salvation, in the blood of Jesus, in the suffering and in the death, and then the resurrection of Jesus. You've provided so abundantly, not only for this life, but for the life that is to come and the world that is to come, that we can enjoy you forever and be in your presence forever. And Lord, we bless you this morning. I thank you for the provisions of this life, the provisions of eternal life, the provisions in Christ. And I bless you, Lord, and I thank you and praise you for what you have done this past year and then for what you're going to do in this coming year and how you're going to lead us into places that you've called us to. May our, 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 our ears be keen to hear your voice. Our hearts be keen to hear your voice and where you want to lead us because your ways are always good and they're always right. And so we bless you. At the end of this year, we bless you and praise you and we look forward to the year that you have before us. Thank you, Father. Lord, I ask now that you would um, direct this service, be with Brother John as he ministers the word and puts thoughts in his mind that, uh, that you have for us to hear. And may your Holy Spirit rest on him as he ministers to us. And for those that are in other places traveling or wherever they are, Lord, I pray that you would bless them and stir their hearts with inspiration wherever they are. Thank you, Father, again for your provisions. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Normally I start with announcements, and I kind of got excited there right off the bat. So now I, can, now I have announcements. That's not normally the way I do that. Um, the, uh, there will be new members teaching uh, this Wednesday, starting this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and I believe they'll be gathering, you'll be meeting in the gathering room. And that is for those who have become new members in the, in the last year or two, or uh, have applied for membership. Um, it's just some, some uh, Brother Pastor Wayne will be teaching on, on things that the Lord has led us into and some things that we here as a church uh, have, have learned from the Word of God. So if you've become a new member or are planning to be a new member, uh, you're asked to be here on uh, Wednesday evening, this Wednesday evening um, at 7 o'clock. And then I think there's going to be additional, um, like uh, probably two more teachings after that. All right? Um, the ushers will be taking up the offering. It's our year-end offering, which we typically... People sometimes want to give at the end of the year in a different manner, so that will be taken up today. And um, let me see. Children, you are dismissed for your Sunday school class, okay? All right. Very good. Brother Pastor John will be ministering to us today the Word of God. I'm looking forward to that, as always. 
All right, the ushers will be taking up the offering here as the worship team begins to lead us in worship.
that everyone's a little heavy with calories and food and families, events the last weeks. But God is always worthy to be praised because we have a good Father. And not only do we have a good Father, but He has freed us. Freed us from the bondage of sin, and He will release us into the life that He has hidden His, in Messiah, in Jesus. And we are part of this story. And 
year end, you always have time for reflection. You think about the years in life and obviously another year rolls by and you stop and think a little bit, where are we at? What does God want for the next year? At the end of the day, we all have personal things, goals, things like that, that we might want to see in life. But as uh, Pastor Steve said this morning, life is limited. And there's this frantic race in people in the world to try to experience everything they can before this life ends. Just everything you can try to possibly do and experience, and whether it's travel or there's this frantic search for some kind of meaning and happiness and fulfillment. You know, sometimes I get restless because I like things. I like things moving too. I like new shiny things. Of course, who doesn't? But then you have to stop and think about all the things that we have been given. Yes, this nation is sick and people need Jesus, but we have blessings beyond 90% of planet Earth. And most times we're still not satisfied. We're looking at our neighbor and saying, I want what he has. And this morning, I just want you to stop and think about what God has given you. The good times, the good memories, there are definitely people in this world who have very little good things to say about their life. But we have experienced good things. And that's the mercy of God. And it's the grace of God because we don't deserve good things. We just don't. Humanity as a whole has not really shown any fruit to which God would be impressed with what we've done. He's not impressed that we created nuclear bombs. He's not impressed that we've done all these damaging wars, that we've destroyed so much life over ideologies and things of this nature. And I'm not talking just politics today. I'm talking about truth. You see, the gospel is simple. And Jesus is the answer. He's the Messiah. He's the one to whom the world longs to see the fullness come. And so this morning, we want to praise him for the freedom that he's given us, the life that he has given us, the breath that he has given us. And may it be that in our last days on this side of forever that we look back and we say God was faithful not how oh how many experiences I had or oh how many things I enjoyed even those those are blessings but Lord I've I have run my race I have completed what you've put into my heart if you want a new year's resolution that's one not, can I lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds? I mean, we all need to lose weight, right? But I shouldn't say all. But to focus on, Father, what, what, what do you want from me next year? And give me the strength to be faithful. Amen. Totally free.
song, joy comes in the morning. And I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Father, we bless you for what you've given to us, and we just commit this to you and bless you for provisions that you have given. In Jesus' name, amen.
praise the Lord. Good morning, and God bless you. I greet you in Jesus' name. Am I turned on? You can hear me okay? All right. Must be my ears, not, not yours. All right. Good. It's good to be with you this morning. And I want to just begin this morning by thanking you for your giving. As I was thinking back over this past year, and I've been doing a lot of reflection, and the message that I have this morning is, are we ready? Are we ready for what? But as I was thinking about this past year and the generosity of you as a congregation and the, the giving that happens on any given week in a corporate setting or in individual settings, I just want to commend you as a congregation for your generosity and your giving. I know that my wife and I have been the recipients of much generosity from you, and for that we're very grateful. Um, many years in ministry, that wasn't always the case. And, and coming here, we have found God meeting our needs in astounding ways through you, his people. And it has been so, so very much appreciated. It's been very humbling at times. And as I think back on this year, some of the, the big things that happened for us, one was being able to purchase a house, which was made possible by generosity from you and others. What a great God we have that stirs hearts to, to make things like that possible. We also took a trip to Israel, which again was made possible only by the generosity of people like yourselves and, and those here. And I just want to thank you. I don't know who all contributed to either one of those things. But one of the things I know is that they wouldn't have been possible had God not stirred hearts to give, and I, we're grateful. And as I think of the giving that happens here, I look at the budget numbers that come in for the church, and I'm amazed at how God provides generously. And may the Lord bless you today. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless your businesses. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you as you close out this year and as you look at a new year. I, I pray God's blessings on each one, that he would prosper, not because of us, but for his glory. Because there is something incredibly glorious to the kingdom of God when his people prosper. And I bless you in that. So are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready for 2024? Are we ready for Daniel 12 and the end of corrupt rule on the earth? Are we ready for King Jesus to return? Are we ready? How would I know if I'm ready? I believe there are some things we can look look at in Scripture and in ourselves as we prepare for the new year. Uh, there's a quote that I often use when I am getting ready for something. And it's a quote that I uh, learned long ago, and it was it's just a very simple one. It just says, preparation is the separation between winning and losing. And you say, well, John, why would you quote that? That's not Scripture. Well, but it does Travel well with some scriptural principles. For instance, Proverbs 22.3 and Proverbs 27.12 says that the prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself. And so there is something about the preparation that brings life, that brings success into the projects that we do. We can be impulsive, and sometimes that works. Sometimes people like to fly by the seat of their pants, and, and they can somehow work it out. I've found that for me, many times, the separation between winning and losing is, in fact, preparation. In fact, I remember making a checklist once for a, a prison tour that I took in Western Canada, and I, I remember getting ready to go, and we were planning, and all the time I was planning to, uh, to make the trip with a rented vehicle, going to haul our music team and our, our instruments and everything. We were just going to do it in motel the way, and... Um, 
That was the way I was setting up. And so I had everything lined up for that. And at the last minute, one of our board members said, you know, John, I think you ought to just take the team bus. I know it might cost a little extra or whatever, but just take the bus, go and, um, and travel that way. It'll be a lot easier for you. So in just a very short time, we had to retool everything and gear up to go that way. And of course, if you've ever camped, you know that if you've had your camper in storage, you get it out and you're going to use it. You've got a, a lot of preparation that goes into that. Well, all of a sudden, we had a bus to get ready to go and making sure everything was taken care of and it was stocked and because now we were going to be eating out less and we were going to be eating in the bus more and all of this stuff. Well, we got on the road and headed out and I think we're doing well and all of a sudden it's time to make my bunk and guess what? I didn't have any bedding. I was planning on staying in motels. My preparations had me geared up for something else and so that night I found a couple of odds and ends pieces of stuff on the bus that I could use for bedding. Of course, the rest of the team, they had all prepared for it. Not me. And um, lo and behold, I, who always carry extra jackets and things along in Western Canada, took the trip and didn't have a jacket. I mean, how many things like that? Didn't have a pillow, didn't have a towel, didn't have... I was, I was so unprepared. Well, the separation between winning and losing is, is preparation, and, and for this, I had not prepared. Now, did I lose? Well, not necessarily, but I certainly had a rough start to my trip on a personal level. So preparation is good, but how do we prepare for a new year? As we look at 2024, how can we be prudent and prepare? Some of you are probably going to point out the irony of me asking that question on December 31st. I mean, the new year starts tomorrow. How can you prepare one day in advance? Well, ready or not, here we come, right? 2024 is tomorrow. But let's not forget the big picture we see in Daniel 12, 1 to 3, and that's the text, I believe, that is up here on the screen. And um, I, I'm very grateful to Arlen and uh, Heather, Miss Heather, who put together the backgrounds for us and I wanted to have a sunrise, and I'm not sure if this is a sunrise or sunset, but I wanted to have the sun rising over Jerusalem because the scripture uses the term of Jesus coming back as a day star shining or a sun rising. Some translations will even use Jesus' term, he'll, the return of the Son of Man will be like lightning, but that term actually could mean like a beam of light from the rising sun. Uh, and, and so when he comes, he will dawn on us as a new day. And he will, he will travel as swiftly as a beam of light, but whether it's darting from here or there, we know that he will come and he will shine on us. And so let's not forget the picture that we see there. There's a day coming and it's getting closer that Jesus will return and the dead shall be raised to judgment. And I know there's a lot in that picture. Some will say, but John, it's not the time for that yet. There's things that have to happen. I understand that. But let's keep this in focus. Let's keep the big picture in view on the horizon of our life. And so Daniel 12, 1 to 3. And this, you're going to say, well, John, this is also a, a prophecy to the nation of Israel. Yes, but our promises to them are the promises. To them are the patriarchs. To them are the covenants. And we are grafted into their promises. We don't receive any of this apart from Israel. And God is doing these things. And so God tells Daniel through an angel, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. He will return. There will be a general resurrection of the dead. And some will be raised to life. Some will be raised to judgment. And those who are wise. 
Are you wise this morning? Are we ready? Are we ready? So it's a macro picture. We see the big picture that is spread out on the horizon. It's in front of us. And don't forget that God plays the long game when he deals with time. Don't forget that with the, day, with the Lord, a thousand years is, is no different than a day when it comes to fulfilling his promises. When God promises, he will fulfill it whether it's a thousand years or a day. And when he puts something out there on the horizon, we look for it. And I believe it's important for us as we look at 2024 that we keep this picture of the return of Christ in our view, on our horizon, that we are not soon discouraged because of the troubles that come, that we don't look around us and see things that are shaky and lose heart, but that we realize that this is going forward and that God is still in control. Keeping that big picture on the horizon, God is keeping his promises and he will return. The question is, are we ready? Are we ready? You see, he's going to return for some of us sooner than others, perhaps. There will be a day when he comes in in clouds of glory and receives his own to him. But as we noticed in this past year of 2023, we lost, in our terms, lost some people. They no longer gather with us. They have passed on from this life. We put it in simple terms, they died. And we miss them. But in this next year, Some of us who are sitting here today may not be here at New Year's next year. Are we ready? These are some of the reflections that have been going on through my mind. We don't know. Old, young, middle-aged. When Jesus comes for us, when he calls us home, that's it. Junior, I'm glad you're still with us. You had a close call. There are others who have had brushes with illness in this past year and are still here. God's not finished with you yet. Praise the Lord. We're not either. We're glad you're here. But then there are others that God has taken on and we mourn their passing. And there's a nearer field of vision, though, than this great big one, and it's 2024. It begins tomorrow. Saying that, I want to look back on 2023. It was a year of great upheaval in many ways. Even though some things seem to have returned to a bit of normalcy as as the pandemic was fading into the rearview mirror somewhat, these normal things might have numbed us a bit to the major changes that have been taking place. Some crazy turns that were taking place in our national security apparatus as well as in our Department of Justice. There have been some serious developments and disturbing patterns that have emerged in 2023. And some of you would probably argue that they've been there for a while, and that's true, but they became very blatant, I believe, and toxic. In fact, I don't know if I've ever seen some of our culture become this blatantly sinful, blatantly deceptive and toxic as it is now. And I think those patterns can spell trouble for the coming year. Are we ready? How do we know? Well, we don't know what's coming. A lot of people like to pretend like they know, and there's people making predictions already. You know, they're coming up with their top five list of top ten, whatever is going to happen in this year. Do we know? Well, God does. And maybe some people who are devising the schemes know what they plan, but... How do we know? If you look back on 2023, who knew that our Department of Justice would so blatantly weaponize the system against those who were considered enemies or opponents of the ruling party? Who would have thought that a slow-moving balloon from China would be allowed to penetrate sovereign U.S. airspace and drift lazily across the continent for 
a week or so. Who would have thought that was possible? Or what of the massive hemorrhaging of immigrants through our southern border that has been unchecked and against the law? Were we prepared for 2023? Say, well, how do you know, John? We made it through, didn't we? Are we prepared for 2024 as Christians? There are many things that happened in the past year that were incredibly disorienting and fearful, shaking our security as laws were passed, changed and enacted that impacted our families, our finances, and our social mores. Then there were mass shootings, lots of them. There were wars and attacks, and over it all, the staggering sums of money that were added to our national deficit. Were we prepared? Are we prepared now? How can you tell? In terms of specifics, there will probably be more surprises coming in 2024. It's a presidential election year, right? Who knows what kind of surprises will come? I know there's a term I became familiar with in the last few election cycles where they talked about an October surprise. I remember listening to uh, commentators on on the radio talking in an election year saying, you know what, at the beginning of the year, the things that will shape the election haven't happened yet. Are we ready? Are we prepared? How do we prepare? You know, we needn't be caught in despair, even if we find ourselves surprised or shocked by what transpires. And that's why I believe it's important that we keep the long view, the big picture in view as we go forward. We need to remember that over all of this, God is in control. That we need not fear that through all of this, He has promised never to leave us or forsake us. And that through this, there can be joy. There can be gratefulness. There can be rejoicing. Rejoicing is really, the the meaning of that is to choose joy. And in every situation, we are called to rejoice, and we can choose joy. We can choose to rejoice in what God is doing, what He has done, and how He is working in us. There are many of you and many of us that if we look back over 2023, we realize that there were significant moments where God's grace carried us through difficult times. Were it not for His grace, we would have been in despair. We would have been cast down. We would have been destroyed. But the grace of God was there to carry us through those times. Are we grateful? Can we rejoice in those times? You see, the enemy of our souls would like us to look at those times and say, yeah, you almost went under. Guess what? If it happens again, you might not be so lucky. And I'll say, no, it wasn't lucky. It was the providence of God. It was his grace. It was his mercy. It was his generosity, his steadfast love that kept us afloat. And because of that, we can choose to have joy. We can choose to rejoice in the goodness of God. When we look at 2024, there are some grim things things on the horizon, but we don't need to despair because God is in the midst of her. Yes, there's a lot of things where the enemy has made inroads, but God told us that these things would happen. We rejoice because he has not left us without a witness, and we can choose joy in these moments. So what must we know as we enter 2024. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 has some very interesting instructions for us. And Jeremiah states this, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. And this is comforting indeed. So why shouldn't I glory or boast in wisdom, strength, or wealth? Well, let's ask the question, first of all, why do most people boast or glory in these things? Why do we typically boast or glory in wisdom, strength, and wealth. 
Wisdom, strength, and wealth are, are bits of security for us, aren't they? If I'm wise and I look ahead, I can foresee the evil with the prudent man and hide myself. But if the prudent man looks ahead and doesn't understand what he sees, he might still make some foolhardy mistakes that will bring ruin to him, right? Wisdom is a sen- brings a sense of security. I can understand what I'm seeing. I can do things with that. So, but let not the wise man glory in his wisdom or what he knows, nor even the mighty man in his strength. Well, what, what about strength? Well, if you're big enough and tough enough, you can protect yourself. If you're big, and t- big enough and tough enough, you probably won't get sick as often. It becomes something of a security. Or if I have wealth, I mean, as Ecclesiastes says, money answers all things. And, and money does answer a lot of things. If I have wealth, I can make a lot of mistakes and still not be too badly off. So wealth can become a sense. And, and he's not saying don't have these things because we're told to be wise. We're told to be strong in the Lord. We're told to occupy, to, to use what God has given us. To, to, so that wealth and strength and wisdom are not bad. But he says don't glory in those. So then what should I glory in? Where should I find my security? Well, our security, God says these are not very secure. Our security comes from knowing and understanding God and his purposes. So I don't need to worry if I'm strong enough or smart enough or wealthy enough to weather the challenges that are coming in 24, 2024. I don't have to worry about that. Because, see, the, the opposite side of boasting is that I worry I don't have enough. When I focus on those things as my security, I may worry that I don't have enough. One minute I say I've got plenty, the next minute I'm not sure I've got enough to make it. He says, don't look at those things. What I need to be most concerned with is that I understand and know God. And what should I know about God? First of all, that He is the Lord. That He is the King. That whatever happens in 2024, regardless of my status in wisdom or might or wealth, He is Lord. And guess what? As Lord, He exercises loving kindness. Some, some translations would say mercies. So God is merciful. He exercises judgment. That means that he is a God of justice and he will not allow things to go unpunished forever. So whatever is wrong and whatever is out of balance in our world, I can rejoice in that I know his character, that he will not allow that to continue indefinitely, but that he will bring a reckoning. He loves judgment. And that he exercises righteousness in the earth. He does what is right. I can find my security in Him. And that's far more secure than my wisdom, my might, or my wealth. And if I look at myself, I'm glad that there's something to find security in other than those three things because I'm sort of a pauper in most of those. Maybe all of them. And if we actually look at how we are equipped and how many times we're frightened and how many times we're anxious, we will realize that Most of us don't have enough wisdom or strength or wealth to deal with our fears. We still have anxieties about how we will deal with things. And so God says, don't let let that be your source of security. Have your source of security be in the fact that you know me and that you understand me and that you understand my character and how I work. These will be your anchor and your security in the new year. So, are we ready? And I should have probably had a screen up here, but I thought sometimes that may be distracting, maybe not. I'm going to give you a little bit of a checklist. You see, when, I went to, when Karen and I went to Israel, we were given a checklist of things that we would need. We'd never been there before. What are we going to need? And so we were given a checklist, and we studied that thing hard, and we looked over that thing, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't caught with blisters or chills, or 
thirsty or whatever. We, we tried to make sure we were following that checklist pretty close so that we would be able to keep up with the group for one thing. We weren't sure if we were going to be healthy enough to do that, but by God's grace, it wasn't too difficult and we were able to manage. But it was, it was a good time, but we used a checklist. So in, in coming forward to 2024, I've got a bit of a checklist for us. The first one is going to be check your appetite. You say, oh no, not the New Year's resolutions. No, what's more on the spiritual side? Check your gospel preparation. Check your reconciliation preparation. That's kind of a tough one. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, but it needs to be looked at. Check your security. Um, and under that heading, I have check your persecution preparation and check your comfort level and lifestyle. And finally, check your arguments. Now, you will forget those, but I'll repeat them. And we'll continue on with this. So, are we ready for 2024? Here's the checklist. Check your appetite. And this really is where we should be starting in our preparation. I think so many people enter a new year with diet and weight loss resolutions. I, I don't know about all of those who make the diet resolutions, but I want to commend anybody who does, because even if you recognize that you need to make a change, that's a good thing. Most people ditch their diets by the second week of January. It's just too blooming disgusting and hard, and man, we're just hungry. So, I, but kudos to you if you make those resolutions. But diet is extremely healthy, extremely important to our, one's health and wellness. And I've noticed that especially as I get older. For instance, I just don't handle sugar that well anymore. I always say I'm allergic to it, it makes me swell up, and it really does. It packs on, and I can't get sugar out of my system very easily. And um, I found that as I get older, my metabolism has changed a lot. But I applaud anyone who even acknowledges their need of a diet plan, whether they follow through or not. So if you were thinking of one, three cheers for you this morning. Good job. Um, spiritually, though, our diets are even more important. And we must be sure that what we're taking into our lives is spiritually beneficial and healthy. Hosea chapter 4, verses 6 to 9 says this, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being a priest before me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they increased... The more they sinned against me, I will change their glory into shame. Now notice verse 8. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. What are we consuming as a culture? That's a really disgusting sounding thing that he says there. They eat up the sin of my people. This is what they feed on. And I find that many people today love to feed on celebrity gossip. We, we love to follow the tawdry tales that are going on in the news of things that people are doing. Lifestyles. Things that we would have been almost ashamed to have even mentioned a mere decade ago are water cooler conversations. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity. I remember the first time I ever saw a dog do something that was so disgusting it almost turned my stomach. And I saw him on a little farm eating cow pies. And I was like, who does something so disgusting? Like, what kind of animal? Man's best friend? Hey, get away from me. Don't lick me, buddy. Why would they do that? I discovered that this is a thing, and, and there are reasons that animals do that, dogs especially. But this is what it reminded me of. That's what I thought of when I read this. You eat up the sin of my people. You eat up these things. It's, it's, the, it's the foulness of their lives, and yet we find it fascinating. You say, John, what are you talking about? I don't. Well, 
Look at what populates your feeds. You know, even some of those blooper reels contain some rather sinful suggestions. Um, what, what are we doing? Are we using these things? Uh, our appetite matters spiritually. And as we look into 2024, friends, let's check our diet. Because this is a time that I believe is going to increasingly bring stress on our Christian walk. And we must be fortified with things that are true and right and just in the sight of God. We need to have a diet that will strengthen us for our walk and our interaction with people. We can't have this stuff and fluff diet of debauchery and whatever. It might look glamorous in today's world, but it's not. And so we need to feed on the right things. What are you consuming from the sin of the people? I'm afraid if God were to evaluate the social media consumption of the modern church, the assessment would probably be the same. You eat up the sin of the people. Hosea 6, 1 to 3 says this, Come, come, let us return to the Lord. For he is torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the coming, as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Let's return. Let's return to the Lord. Let's return to the knowledge of God. Let's seek him. Let's seek what he is about. What Matt said this morning was so powerful about surrendering our life to God, saying, how can I work with you, Lord? What is, what is your plan for my life? Let's return to the Lord. All right, so then check your gospel preparation. We check our appetite. Let's check our gospel preparation. And so I'm asking you this, are you ready to share the gospel of Jesus Christ that sets men free in 2024? Are you ready? If you were to meet the Ethiopian eunuch in his chariot today, are you ready to share the gospel? Beginning where he is and taking him through to the message of salvation. You say, John, don't be legalistic. I mean, conversations like that don't happen like that anymore. We, we, we are friendly. We smile a lot, and people wonder why we're smiling. We pull weeds without cursing in our yard, and our neighbors say, you know, I think they must be Christians. We smash our fingers on the job, and we don't cuss, so this must be, or maybe we only use sort of the sanctified swear words and they know we must have something going on in our lives because we don't use the really bad ones. No, are you ready to share the gospel this, this year? Why or why not? One of the good ways you can tell if you're ready to share the gospel in 2024 is if you've actually shared the gospel in 2023. See, most of us are too busy telling people well, how bad our life is or how bad the, the economy is or how bad the government is or how bad the justice system is and we never get around to telling them how good Jesus is and what he can do in our lives because we're so hopeless, we're so depressed that we kind of just give the impression that maybe we don't have any hope either. I always think it's interesting because in, in the book of Peter, we're told that we are to be ready to give an answer to everyone that asks us about the hope that's in us. Well, statistically, Christians are as depressed as the rest of the world today, and I don't think many people are asking us about the hope that's in us. Why are you so cheerful? Why do you have a positive outlook on life? Why do you have joy in the midst of this type of situation? Nobody's asking us that because we don't have that joy in this situation, or at least we don't display it. Are you ready to, to share the gospel 
this year. When was, some, when was the last time somebody said, you know what, you just seem that there's something in your life that is different from the rest of us. What is it? Some of you say, well, that happened just yesterday, John. Well, praise the Lord. What about the rest of us? When was the last time? These are things that we need to consider. If we are unable to share the gospel, think about this. What would it take to get ready? If I'm not ready, what would it take me to get ready? Well, I might ask a question like this. Am I fearful to share the gospel of Jesus with people around me? If so, why? What do I need to do to get over that fear? Do I feel like I don't know how to share the gospel of Jesus? A lot of people say, well, John, I I just don't know. I mean, how, how do I share that? Well, are there resources that you can learn? Maybe your resolution in 2024 would be to say, you know what? I want to be able to share my faith. I want to find ways to do that. In 2024, I want to be able to share the gospel of Jesus that sets people free. I don't want to have to say, well, you know, you need to go talk to my pastor. I want to be able to share right out of my experience and and what God has done in me and, and what I have seen in his word. I want to be able to tell them about the truth that will set them free. What would it take to learn that? Take stock. Do I have the resources available to me? What needs to happen for me to know the gospel well enough to feel comfortable sharing it with others? And what are some things that I might eliminate from my life so that I would have time to actually learn how to share the gospel? Now, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm just saying this is the checklist. Uh, Check your gospel preparation because we're supposed to be ready to give an answer I'm not saying, don't put yourself on a guilt trip, just ask yourself the question, could I tell people the gospel if they asked? All right, because this this message is not about a guilt trip, it's about, are we prepared? Do I know? As Christians, those who are born again, this is something that the scriptures consistently tell us over and over, that this should be something that we are ready to do at all times. Not as a matter of performance, but as, a, as an overflow because we're grateful for what God is doing in our lives. You say, John, you talked about being anxious. You just now made me even more anxious. How am I going to do this? I, I, I'm, I hate talking to people about these things. You know, if we could only talk about Jesus like our favorite tool or, or like that new cosmetic product that is just doing wonders for our skin. You know, it, it would be so easy to talk to people about him. But why is it so hard to talk to people about what God is doing for my, my spirit, for my relationships, how he is transforming these things around me? You know, but it's hard because we feel somehow like, I mean, I can tell you about a skin product, a skincare product, or I can tell you about a new barbecue tool, But it's hard for me to tell you about Jesus Christ because I might make you feel bad. I don't mind telling you you don't have the best tools for the job. I've got better ones than you because that's just kind of cool. But if I tell you that I've got a better spiritual hope than you, now I'm scared. Does that make sense? Why do we do that? You say, John... How does this work for 2024? I believe, friends, that in 2024, there's going to be less people that we can depend on to tell tell the story for us. There are going to be fewer people that will speak out in public about this. There's going to be fewer athletes with John 3.16 written under their eyes. There's going to be fewer uh, celebrities standing on stage receiving awards naming the name of Christ. And one could argue that maybe they haven't made that big of an impact anyway. I find that many people, when they have a platform, are more concerned about keeping their platform than using the platform. And so they don't want to say anything on the platform that might cause the platform to be taken away from them. And so the platform becomes useless and pointless. But you and I have a platform every day with the people that we meet. We have a place of relating. Let's not be scared to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Again, this is not by way of berating anybody. It's just simply stuff that I ponder, and I'm thinking, why don't we do more of it? Um, so maybe as you're contemplating 2024, maybe you think about that. If I've checked my appetite, maybe if I'm not so enamored with the sin of other people, maybe I will actually be a little more shocked by that sin, and maybe I will say, you know what, they really do need Jesus. Because without him, their future doesn't look too bright. All right. And then the real fun one, check your reconciliation preparation. I think it was Mark Twain that said, uh, you know, most people, when they, most men, when they stumble over truth, pick themselves up and hurry off and hope nobody noticed. Well, when I talk about reconciliation, it's one of those things that I'd rather skip over quickly. So I will, but I do have to touch on it. So in 2024, are we prepared to reconcile with spouses, with children, with churches, with coworkers, with God, with siblings, with in-laws, or maybe in your case, outlaws? What would this take on your part? Because we're told that as much as lies within you to live at peace with all men especially those of the household of faith. And you're going to probably tell me right off the bat, but John, I know that's one of the things about preaching as I hear that, but John, you don't understand, but John, there, there's those but Johns that come after messages sometimes. These things are rather impossible right now. And some of you are going to hedge this question with another question and you're going to say, what do you mean by reconcile, John? What does that look like? What do you think it looks like? Did you ever see somebody reconcile? Yeah, but I don't like the way that looked. That looks too difficult. What do you mean by reconcile? I've, John, I've already done all that I can. It's in their court now. Well, if that's truly the case, then you're reckon, ready to reconcile as soon as they are. And you can answer, yes, I'm ready to reconcile in 2024. What gets us most often, though, is the stuff that we're still hanging on to that we haven't really let go of and that we're, we're still demanding. As you look at 2024, I'm going to believe that 2024 is going to be a year when carrying bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness is going to be a huge detriment to our spiritual walk and stability. So check your preparation for reconciliation. Consider this. If your means of communication with this person or persons or group, by the way, when I ask, how is your preparation for reconciliation, how many of you actually had a, a face pop into your mind? Nobody's going to raise their hands, right? I like asking questions that nobody wants to raise their hands. Um, it, it gets quiet, and then, and then everybody looks and says, I wonder, uh, and it gets nervous and, and all of these things. But you know in your heart if a face came to mind. Are you ready to reconcile? If you were able to, would you be ready to reconcile? Or do you kind of enjoy that tension that exists there? Is it kind of nice to keep them out, out of your sphere just a little bit because we're just not speaking right now? Ask yourself some of these questions. Again, not a guilt trip. It's, it's a checklist. It's a self-assessment. Do I have what it takes going into 2024? And with this, you can actually begin to work on some things. Um, one of the things that happens is most of us, I say one of the things, many of us do not take the time to think through these things because they're, dif they're difficult. We just don't want to look at them. But Pastor Wayne has taught us much about forgiveness in the past two years, reminding us even of the Lord's Prayer where 
We pray and ask God to forgive us in the same way we forgive those who have sinned against us. Are we ready to reconcile? It's a tough one. I told you I was going to hurry through it, so I will. Check your security. Are you prepared for political, financial, or civil upheaval in 2024? How many of you got just a little nervous listening to a podcast or reading an article about a financial crash that's coming? Some of you were real smart, and and I, I don't say that facetiously, and have invested in precious metals. Other things, getting out of currency. That's a, that's a brilliant maneuver. But how many of you, how many of us are prepared for upheaval? You say, well, John, how do you become comp- prepared for upheaval? Well, it goes back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the mighty man in his might, nor the rich man in his riches. We prepare for these things by becoming intimately acquainted with God who holds our futures in his hands. Yeah, there are things we can do to to make sure we're prepared for um, these eventualities in practical ways, but at its very basic, we need to be intimately acquainted with God and his character. And no, I'm not issuing a prophecy. I don't know what's going to happen in 2024. I can look at 2023 and say if it continues at that pace, then yeah, we're going to have some real issues. I do know that observing our system of government, our what used to be a stable financial system, and our legal system, they all show signs of extreme instability. In fact, it's to a level that I've never witnessed before. Now, I'm not that old, so... I'm sure there were times when it was that bad or worse. But in my short life, I haven't seen that. As for our national security and open borders, it appears that we are increasingly on our own as citizens. But does that mean we can be anarchists? Does that mean we can be defiant of our government? Does that mean we can be disrespectful of elected leaders or appointed leaders? No. It doesn't, but are we prepared for these things? Have we considered how we respond in a godly way? You see, it's it's not just about getting on, on social media and ranting about these things and trying to stir up everybody's frustrations and fears, but it's really how do we speak life and peace into these situations, even things that are beyond our control. It's not about raising a mob to chase people down. There's plenty of people raising mobs today. There's plenty of people gearing up. There's plenty of well-armed basements and well-armed and, and provide uh, provisions that are, are stored up and, and people are preparing for all kinds of things. You know, that's okay. I'm, I'm guessing that's their prerogative. But how are we as Christians to prepare? Where is our faith? Where is our confidence? Where is our security? As to financial stability, it's hard to imagine succeeding on a foundation of indebtedness. Consumer debt in the States has risen to levels almost unheard of. Credit card debt, other debts. And then our government seems to think that the the way to get out of debt is to print money, or uh, I'm not sure. It it just always seems that there's more debt to to, to hand around. And and so all of these things can can bring a, a real sense of instability. Where is your stability? Where is my stability? As we go into 2024, are we equipped spiritually, mentally, and emotionally to walk through this and be able to still rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Are we able to let our gentleness be known to all people because the Lord is at hand? Do we walk with the understanding that the Lord is at hand and therefore we can afford to be gentle? Therefore, we can afford to respond with a peaceable answer and quietness rather than angst and anger. 
We're increasingly a lawless society. We have lawlessness and measures we would not have dreamed of even five years ago. I mean, when you watch retail outlets being routinely looted, and, and in certain states where you can't even prose prosecute thievery unless it reaches a certain dollar threshold, it's a lawless society. And you say, John, this is a New Year's message. You're supposed to be making me feel good and excited about the coming year. Well, I'm telling you, we can't look at these things. We have to understand we live in a world that has these things going on, but our joy doesn't come from an absence of conflict. It comes from the presence of Christ in the midst of conflict. These things, the world may be lawless, but we are not lawless before God. We have a God who loves justice and who acts with righteousness, and he anticipates and calls us to do the same, and he gives us the grace to do that. We are not to be discouraged by what we see around us. We are to take courage because our redemption is near. Our redemption is in Christ. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. When acknowledged laws have a visible double standard of enforcement, when the crimes of certain people are minimized and the crimes of others are magnified, when the media are allowed to try people in the court of public opinion, even before the courts have finished their judgment, when a person's life can be dramatically altered by news reports that may or may not be true, with little or no accountability by the media. It has scared many people into silence. Are we those who are silent, or are we stay, will, will we stand up for the truth? And, and here's, here's part of the problem. When nothing seems to be black or white anymore, it seems to fade into this foggy gray that has no definition. We're not sure where we are, and it leaves us wondering what are our responsibilities? What are our privileges? What are our rights as, as people? Can we stand on truth? When you're challenged for your beliefs, do you run and hide or do you go silent? Be alert. Ask yourself, am I standing in truth? Am I confident? And then check your persecution preparation. Am I ready to suffer persecution for Christ in 2024? Well, John, what does that mean? Well, let's just put it this way. The world and the media hates Jesus Christ. They do not like the conviction he brings, nor the exclusivity that he demands. See, if I promote Jesus Christ as the only way to peace with God, today that makes me a bigot and hateful, because I'm telling you the choice that you have made as a way to peace with God or finding some kind of life with deity, if I'm telling you that my way is the right way, I have just cut you out. So to tell people that Jesus is the only legitimate way to peace with God, the world hates it. Our media hates it. And to speak in those ways can get people thrown in jail, actually, as hate speech. Are we ready to suffer persecution? Am I ready to be insulted? I, I was, as I was thinking about this question, I had to think of the old song, Rise Up, O Men of God. Remember that song? How many of you remember, remember hearing, Rise Up, O Men of God? And there was a verse that kept running through my mind. It was, rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. And I thought, man, what are the lesser things that I have latched onto that have caused me to be silent, to lay down on the job, to, to try to fade into the upholstery, if you will, to, to not be seen? But we're called to rise up and to serve the Lord with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I love that. Rise up, O men of God. And I'm going to say, rise up, O women of God. Have done with lesser things. Have done with lesser things. Put them out of your life. 
Check your appetite, but just, let's just get rid of these things and let's focus on that big macro picture that God is returning, that Christ will reign and rule from Jerusalem, that this is the reality that is coming, and yet we live in anticipation of that, and we need to walk, having done with lesser things, and realize that this is our goal, this is our aim, this is our God that we walk with. And then check your comfort level and lifestyle. This is all having to do with security. Comfort level and lifestyle has been something that has been an extreme motivator for people. Some people pursue a lifestyle, and so that actually dictates their life choices until they achieve that lifestyle. And then they spend the rest of their life trying to protect that lifestyle. And we love comfort. We love security. We love, and our levels of comfort and style may be totally different. Some people would do anything to protect, you know, their shack by the creek and and just being able to be there. The next person wants to protect their ability to have a beautiful place, well manicured and all of that. And, And it doesn't, it's not that one or the other is right or wrong. It's when our security is there or when we are willing to, to give up important things to maintain that. So when I ask if you're ready to have your comfort tampered with or taken away in 2024, some of you might say, but John, isn't that fear-mongering? Aren't you just trying to scare us into something? No, I'm not actually suggesting that your comfort level will be taken away in 2024. What I'm asking is this. Will you be able to stand at any time if your comfort, comfortable standard is, of living is reduced or restricted? Will you be able to stand firm if standing firm for the faith means that you're going to have a restricted standard of living. What would you give up to retain your current level of comfort? What would you give up to retain your current level of comfort? So let me just say this. Don't let comfort or the love of comfort or lifestyle leave you in a spot of weakness. Don't let that become the spot at which the enemy silences you. Don't let the love of temporary popularity or comfort put you in a spot of weakness that would allow you to lose or cause you to lose an eternal reward. And then check your surrender. Are we ready to surrender all completely to Jesus in 2024? I was thinking of the words of another song uh, by Annie Herring in which she says, All that I am, all that I need, all that I ever hope to be, all that I dream, all that I love, all that I hold so dear to me. And then the song continues and says, It's in your hand of love and grace. And I think about that and I say, Am I willing to surrender all of that? to the Lord Jesus for his purposes and his greater glory. What if in 2024 I simply gave God a blank sheet of paper devoid of my desires? What if I said, Lord Jesus, I don't want to tell you what I want this year. What I desire more than anything is for you to tell me your priorities and the desires you have for my life. How can I position myself to work with your will? How can I be available for your work? What if I was to do that? What if you were to do that? How would it look different from your preparation so far for 2024? What if I would tell God what I desire more than anything is for you to tell me your priorities and your desires Lord, how can I position myself to work with your will? Pastor Wayne reminded me um, here just this past week about a a verse and a a statement that he he often uses, and it's that, uh, that passage or that verse that says, commit your works to the Lord and he will establish your thoughts. What if we would do that with 2024? 
Lord, I'm committing my works in 2024 to you. I don't know what you want me to do, but would you establish my thoughts? These are the things in front of me, but would you establish my way? Would you establish me in the way that I should go? Check your surrender. All right, then check your arguments. These questions that I've been asking you on this checklist have a way of making me uncomfortable. And I'm going to guess they have a way of making you uncomfortable. Some of you are probably already arguing with these questions. Telling yourself, but yeah, he's asking these questions, but they miss perspective. Uh, you might be squirming and excusing yourself saying, you know, there needs to be context for these questions. I mean, yeah, they, they're right in certain contexts, but I mean, my life on the whole is, is, all, is all right. And, and we really shouldn't be having questions like this in a sermon. We should be exhorted to things, not asked uncomfortable questions. There needs to be more context with this. Of course, we will all reason that our motives are right, and nobody's perfect, right? And don't we all indulge in a little frivolous fun at times? And, you know, all of those things are a way to minimize our accountability before God. And they are ways of trying to get us off the hook and say, but yeah, my, I, I do enjoy watching some obscene humor at times, or I, I do enjoy, you know, hearing what some of these ungodly people are doing. And, but it's, it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. And it's, I mean, don't we all? We can't be perfect. You know, Let me just say that if you're arguing in your heart and mind about these things or trying to justify yourself this morning, just stop. Just stop. And then ask the Lord Jesus. Maybe, maybe John doesn't ask the right questions. But Lord Jesus, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. Is there anything, is, is there truth that I have been avoiding? Are, are there things in, in my life that I've been avoiding? Maybe it's even far from what John is preaching this morning, but... Are there things that you would like to touch in my life that I have just simply been turning a deaf ear to? Ask him that. Don't let the questions that I've been asking you allow you to put up a screen to hide what God is touching in your life. If God is touching something there and you're saying, boy, I'm just glad John didn't mention that this morning, well, then deal with that. You know, maybe the things I've said got you off the hook, but... If there's something God's fingered in your life, then you deal with that, okay? We want to be ready to walk with boldness in 2024. Here's the deal. God's going to pre present to himself a bride without spot or wrinkle. So are you, are you willing this morning to let God uh, take the heat of his iron to that wrinkle you've been kind of cherishing and trying to make look trendy in your life? but he'd like to get rid of it. Are you willing to let him do that? Because there are changes coming in the near future. Friends, God has never let nations continue on indefinitely in their sin without bringing judgment. Judgment is meted out. The, the United States of America has been storing up judgment and wrath under God. With each warning, with each thing that has come on the nation, we have hardened our hearts. And we've said, it's always been good, it'll keep on being good. Just understand that God doesn't leave that forever. I'm not saying it's coming this year, I'm not saying it's coming next, but understand that God never allows a nation to continue. And when I look at what is going on in our nation, we lead the world in much sin. Yes, we have many godly people that are still doing wonderful things, but in our nation there is, friends, there is rottenness that is tolerated by a people. And God will not allow that to last forever. And so there is judgment coming. Be sure that when judgment 
on the nation does come that your heart is right before God. It may not spare you trouble in this life, but it will preserve your soul for glory in eternity. So how then should we live? Say, John, you've asked us a bunch of questions about are we ready? And I'm not going to ask you how many of you said, well, you totally missed me with all of these. I'm just going to say if I missed you, and I'm going to pray that God hits you with some that you need to answer because we're all heading into 2024, at least at this point. We're all still here, and we will head in together, Lord willing. May God give us grace to be ready. So how should we live in 2024? I, I love the book of First Thessalonians, and I was reading through uh, First and Second Thessalonians this week, along with a lot of others, as I was trying to wrap up my Bible reading before the end of the year. And First Thessalonians 5, um, beginning at verse 11, I want to read this passage. Uh, the, the, the Thessalonian church doesn't have a lot of issues that are addressed as far as grave sin issues, but they are encouraged or they're, they're admonished often in these letters to comfort each other, to speak life to each other, to encourage each other. And in a variety of places, you'll see that comfort each other with these words, comfort each other in this way, Bring, speak these things, uh, you know, abound more and more in your brotherly love. And, and, and it seems like Paul is really encouraging this church who is facing some difficult situations. It, it, the history of, of the Thessalonian church, they faced persecution. They faced a lot of resistance in the culture. They faced a lot of sexual perversion in the culture. And so at one point in, in I think it's chapter 4, Paul says, I, I, want you to, I want you to understand that God's goal for you is your sanctification. He wants to make you holy, so abstain from sexual impurity. And he goes on with a variety of things, but in chapter 5, he rounds this out and he says this, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another. That means build each other up. Edifying is speaking life into each other and, and encouraging and building up, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Now, these are excellent instructions for entering a new year, aren't they? Be at peace among yourselves. Warn those who are unruly. How many of you have a few unruly people in your life? Um, be careful how you warn them, but warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. How many of you have gotten just really tired of that one timid person that seems like they can never have the strength to go on? Comfort them. Comfort them. Encourage them. They face things that you may not even be aware of. Comfort them. Encourage them. Uphold the weak. And boy, be patient with all. Be patient with all. How many of you have had at least one fellow employee or a boss or a spouse or a child in December that tried your patience to the utmost? Yep. Well, guess what? Be patient with all. Somehow they're included in that all. If he would have said be patient with some or be patient with the deserving, that would be one thing. But he says be patient with all. So in 2024, you're going to see some of these people again. Be patient. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. He keeps putting that crazy word in there, all. And then, rejoice always, verse 16. Choose joy always. Choose to focus on the fact that the Lord is at hand. 
Choose to rejoice in what he has done in bringing you through the last trial. Don't despair that you're facing another one. Rejoice that he brought you through the last one and you still have energy to face another one. You're not sure you're going to get through it, but he brought you through the last one, so maybe he'll bring you through this one. Rejoice, always. Choose joy. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. People say, well, how in the world am I I'm supposed to pray without ceasing? I mean, i got to stop to eat, don't I? No, it just be reasonable. i got to sleep, don't I? Yeah, you do. But he's saying, don't give up. Keep on praying. That's what praying without ceasing is. It's not round the clock, 24-7, steady stream of words. It's saying, don't stop. Don't stop praying. Pray, and then pray again, and pray again. Continue in that relationship with God. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This might be a tough one. You know, he uses words like all, and then he says rejoice always, and now he says in everything. How many of you had a situation this past week that you weren't thankful for? Well, John, I mean, how am I supposed to do this? Well, you know, I think that in everything doesn't mean give thanks for everything. But in this situation, is there something I can give thanks for? In this situation, can I thank God that it wasn't worse? In this situation, can I thank God that he's given me better days? In this situation, can I thank God that this too shall pass? See, it's, it's, not, it's about a, an attitude that comes out in our, our thinking and in our responses. We tend to look at this thing and we say, man, this really stinks. I can't believe God let this happen to me. But turn it around and say, no. It, it does, it, it is difficult, but can I thank God that he's walking through it with me? I'm going to ask the worship team, are, are we able to do a song? I know we lost some of our people. Are we, is there a song available at the end here? Or Okay, well, I'm going to say that, and if it's not, then Pastor Wayne, I'm going to be closing here in just a bit. So if the team doesn't come, I'll, I'll look for Pastor Wayne uh, to, to close the service. So, in light of what we've read in 1 Thessalonians, he says, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Uh, giving thanks is actually God's will for you to do. Do you know that? God, God wants you to give thanks. That's his will in Christ Jesus for you. So start thanking him. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So, how do we live in 2024? Live as if each day was your last. Now, you've heard that before. And it kind of goes in one ear and out the other, right? How many times have we heard that? Live each day as if it was your last. Well, sure, John, that lasts about one day. All right, but then the next day, live as if it was your last. It changes how you look at things. Live as if God is waiting at the end of the day to speak with you and to give you an assessment on your focus and intent. When you speak with people, consider speaking with them as if this was the last conversation you were going to have with them on this earth? How would that change the focus? Occupy your time by what will please and honor God the most in each moment.
Are we ready? Are we ready for the big picture when Christ returns? Are we ready for the near field image of 2024? Can we walk together in this year encouraging each other, edifying each other, comforting each other, spurring each other on to love and good works? Can we wake each other up when we're sleeping? Can we stir each other to hearts of thankfulness? Can we challenge each other? You see, I think it's time for the church of God to really come together as a body and to stand together to walk as a light in this world. Let's, let's be a light. Let's walk together. Are we ready? You know what? Time will tell, won't it? If the world stands and the Lord tarries, we may go through another year of wars and rumors of wars. Let us not forget to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because there's something about the peace of Jerusalem and God's covenant with Israel that we are a part of through Messiah. Because Messiah is coming for Israel and those who are in him by faith. There are going to be many wars that happen. There's going to be many conflicts. The ones that hit the news are the ones that include Jews. In the, in the last week, there have been heinous things that have happened in other countries. Massacres in African nations. Massacres in other predominantly uh, Islamic places where one faction is against another. They're not making the news. Why? In today's world, where there are no Jews, there's no news. At least it seems that way. Let us pray for God's purposes in this world, in 2024, that his purposes would be established. Not just for the nation of Israel, but in all the world. But maybe especially for the peace of Jerusalem. May God bless each one of us today. Yeah.
The grip of shame has strangled us. You took a part yourself alone. And on the third day, you broke my chains. Hallelujah. He is alive. He is alive. From the darkest place, even there we find your grace. You crush the shackles of our sin, and in you we're born again. Because you live today, we are redeemed. If we kneel we bow to the honor of your name, and every time. Thank you, Brother John, for bringing a close to the year and a new beginning. And you know, I found out that you can't have a new beginning if you drag old things by. So you have to close this past year to start a new year. And this is so important. Uh, the Bible even says that in principle. Uh, if, any, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. New. See? New. Old things are passed away. And my thing is, the way I look at New Year's is, in, in this year especially, I'm always looking forward to starting and turning a new year. But if you're going to drag the old year by and, you know, where you have maybe failed and things like this, you're just going to have a same repeat. And what you'll find is year after year will just be in a circle. And that's not what life is. Life is not that. There is more to life than that. And so I just, again, just recommend. I, I know that in my life there's some, there's some people that I, I, I'm pleased with their, perhaps their personalities. And I wish I could be more like them. Do you know anyone like that? You know, we kind of look at, I wish I would be outgoing like so-and-so. But I'm not. I'm bashful and then I look like I'm stuck up to most people but I'm not I just don't know what to say I don't know how to I just rather hide that's kind of me and so uh, every year I have been working on overcoming that and doing a better job of it so I have some things that I'd like to leave behind in this year 
And I want to challenge you all. There might be some things that we all need to leave behind. Amen? Amen. One thing is, I have to forgive everyone. If there's people that have failed you, people that have done things, or, or other things, don't drag last year, don't drag 10 years ago with you. That, there's no life in that. We are overcomers, and that means we get ahead. We get ahead. Amen? Lastly, not least, by far not, is the offering that was taken today um, was a total of, here's one thing that I wish I could overcome. This. <laughs> okay. The offering was 87000 total uh, for the year-end offering, and I just want to thank you all for contributing to that. And I not only thank you for that, but I also want to pray that God would bless you for what you gave. Amen. That it would be returned and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. Amen. This is uh, things that you gave to the Lord. And I know that in the middle of the summer when, or the fall, we, when we had the conference, there was, uh, there was a lot of money came in then too. You're a very supportive church. And God has blessed you in many ways. I find that. I've even heard reports that people have said this. This is actually a rumor that went in the community. It was not a bad rumor. It was actually a good rumor that people that go to church there, God blesses them financially. This came from community people. And I've seen that, literally seen that. So I am always concerned about that. I'm always concerned about your finances. You might not know that, but those of you that know me for years know that's always been my heart, that I don't like when people struggle. Um, and I would that God could bless you and God could open the windows of heaven upon your life. And that is always a prayer. God, it, God, you know, you've heard me pray that many times. But sometimes there's things in our lives that we need to clean up before he can start doing that to us. Amen. He needs to establish our thoughts. And I'll say one more thing, uh, just, just a good thing again. I remember that I was going through just a rough time of making decisions, just business decisions. This was years ago. And I was driving up in Canton and cross railroad tracks, and there was a sign that said, in all thy ways acknowledge him, he will direct your path. And I was like, Oh, wow, that's where that was seated into me. I knew that verse before, but for some reason it needed to get a hold of me. There it was really put in my heart. And then I know that if I acknowledge him in all my ways, this is another thing I sent to John, all my ways, in all your ways, everything you do, in all your ways, we all have different ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him. You know what he will do? He will direct your path. It doesn't say that he might or he'll try to. He will if you acknowledge it. That's the way it is. And I found that to be a tremendous help. And to also know that God is directing my path. This is what, why he has directed me. And I, I, I stand here before you and look at the 68 years old. And after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, my life was so dramatically changed and in what happened, I learned to walk in the Holy Spirit. And in this, I look at all the things of, that I was in a, or not able to do in my life. I mean, there was, there was so much inability in my life to where he brought me today. There's only basically one thing that I can give credit to, and that's my God. Really, that is my God. It was not me. I did not have the ability that God has portrayed out of me. And it's because of my God. And I would that that would be your testimony as well. When you get to be as good as 68 years old like I am. Amen? And even older. So I want to pray specifically that God would direct you in many ways this year. And also to commit your works to him. He will establish those thoughts. Amen. Father, I just pray. Thank you, Lord, for the message you brought today. The challenges and so forth, and, and looking for the year to come, but then also leaving behind this year. 2023, there's many good things, but even the good things we leave behind because there's a new horizon and a new future in front of us. And that future starts 
today, in the next minute, and in the next hour, and in the next day, and in the next year. So, Father, we pray that you would help us to leave behind and open a new page, a new book, a new page, a new 12 months. And, Lord, I just pray also that you would open the fountains of the deep in people's lives. Lord, where people have given faithfully all year long, and this big offering of 87,000, you know exactly where it came from, is almost like it's a stream looking from the pockets of the people, the hands of the people that have worked in their sweat. And they came today and throughout the year, and they put this in an offering. And I pray, Father, that you would backtrace this and go back and place your blessing on these people. Father, that... You see, Lord, the reason so often you can't bless people is because we shut the heavens up because of our complaining. We always look at ourselves as being the underprivileged. That's why you can't open the door, because we are not the underprivileged. We are the privileged. We are the blessed people. We're the ones that the heavens open, op uh, open over us. We're the ones that hear, Lord, you, you watch over us. You're the one that supplies our needs. The world is out there, and the sinners are out there all over the place. Lord, you, you're not supplying their needs necessarily in the way you do us. And so we thank you and we bless you and we praise you, Father. And we pray that you would return this money that was being put in here, Lord. Go back into the foundations of these people. And Lord, if you need to redo something in the foundations, redo something so that your blessing could be there. And I pray also, Lord, for health, healing. I pray even right now as people are standing here, if there's people that have issues, something that's wrong within them, and I pray that you would fix it right now. Father, you're known to do that. We don't just have to go out and lay hands on people or anoint people. You, yeah, you ask us to do that, and we do, that, we do so. But I pray right now that you would visit every person that's standing in here, everyone that's standing, and Lord, protect them from evil, harm, and danger in 2024. Protect them from disease. To protect them from cancer and things like this, Lord. We pray that every cell of the body and the fabric of the being, Lord Jesus, would come under your sanctification power and under your deliverance power, then also under your healing power, Lord Jesus, so that you can pour out upon these souls your blessing and your goodness. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Father. You are our Father, which is in heaven. And we hallow your name. We do so, Lord, because we honor you. This is who you are. You are truly our Father. Direct our path. Allow us to see things that we've not seen. Allow us to hear things that we've not heard, perhaps. So, Father, we again, just now anew as a body, we give ourselves over to you completely, Lord. We lay ourselves before you. And we pray, Father, for deliverance where deliverance is needed. We pray for healing where healing is needed. We pray for restoration, restructuring of our, of, of our lives, principles and thoughts of our mind and thoughts of our path. Lord, we ponder the path of our feet. And we know we've strayed from you at times. But we are looking forward, Lord, to do that which you've asked us to do in this next year. Father, thank you and bless everyone, Father, with abundance. And, and Lord, we pray also for the church throughout the whole world that you would bless them, protect them, especially in these dangerous places that we're living in this latter day. Thank you, Father, for the total provision in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. One more last thing that I'd like to say that the Lord has instructed me as far as 2024. And I think also when he instructs me, he always uses other people or instructs other people as well. This is what God showed me. And this has already been going for several weeks now that he showed me clearly. Get all your loose ends tied up. All the different things that are loose ends in your life. And get this taken care of in 2024 because there's something coming. And I'm not sure. I have no idea what that is. Whether it's something personal 
but it's time to, let's not drag from one year to the other. Let's get our loose ends. Anything that needs done, finish it, projects or whatever it is, get our loose ends. Things that have not been attended to correctly, take care of it. Take care of it. Uh, and I believe this is spiritually as well. Amen. Uh, this is what God has instructed me in my personal life. And I'm looking forward to 2024 to be diligent in some things that I've not been able to do. Even some natural things that God wants me to finish and take care of it. Amen. And I think there's probably others of you that God is speaking to. God bless you so much. We'll see you next year.